Good Tuesday to everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and we're here studying God's Word as we want to come and do these on particular days. I've chosen Tuesdays and Thursdays for now to be our times of study at the Meek Street uh, Church of Christ. We want to talk about God's Word and look at great words of the Bible. We want to look at some of the things like we've done in our past lessons or Bible study lessons about how we can be better Christians and following God's word as we should. The title of our lesson today, Great Words of the Bible, we're going to look at the word laughter today. Laughter is an interesting word. It's one of those words that we have as we come. Uh, a lot of times in life, we see many things that are funny, and we think, well, where did laughter come from? Well, it came from God. It came from the one that we serve and who is a joyful God that we serve. He's also one who wants us to also be joyful and have laughter and laugh as we think about in times of life and how that, that's something that brings us great joy. It's an expression of that joy sometimes that we have. And we look to Webster. Webster defines uh, these things, the meaning of to laugh. We're going to look at that particular way of look, the word laugh itself. Webster defines it as to express amusement, mirth, contempt, and, and we sometimes think of laughing as mocking sometimes. Uh, by inarticulate, in inarticulate explosive sounds, which result from the forcing out of air from the lungs, usually accompanied by convulsive muscular movements. And really all that saying is how our face, it's usually it says especially of the face. And we have sometimes talk about belly laughs where people will laugh and they'll have their belly will kind of shake as they laugh. We tend to think about people like that or being joyful. Uh, and it shows in our face times. We smile a lot of times when we're laughing, we're smiling and there's just a, a joyful type of, of expression there. And I think God wants us to have that in our lives, to have laughter, times of joy and rejoicing as we come to God. And I really think that's what the word describes. It describes the actions of those who are merry and hard, as the Bible refers to that particular type of phrase. Several times in the book of Proverbs, it mentions, like in Proverbs 15, verse 13, where it says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. That's referring to what your face looks like and how you're smiling and, and what kind of, of face that you have. And that shows sometimes by the way we talk and the way we laugh and the way we conduct ourselves. But a merry heart, you can see that in from inside someone not the blood pump that we're talking about here, but the, the mind and the, the emotions of someone who really is a joyful person. He says, by, by sorrow, and this is the contrast to that, by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Another one of these very similar is in Proverbs 15, verse 15, just a couple of verses down. Does all the days of the afflicted are evil? He starts with the bad one first there. But he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. And that refers to the idea of a person uh, has a lot to rejoice about, and they're always rejoicing, happy. You know, we have to make question ourselves. Do we want to be the person that's all the time doom and gloom, like Eeyore, like that uh, Winnie the Pooh kind of character, the Eeyore just always run around with nothing good to say? Or do we want to have that continual feast? The idea of feasting refers to rejoicing. That's why they would have these feasts sometimes, because they were rejoicing. You remember when the story of the prodigal son, they were rejoicing because he came back to the father in safe and sound. And they killed the fatted calf. They had a feast. And that's why they were rejoicing because the son who was dead was now alive again in the sense of being back home where he belonged. And so a merry heart has a continual feast. And in Proverbs 17, verse 22, the Bible says a merry heart does good like medicine but a broken spirit dries the bones. And that again talks about how that we look at our lives and does that merry heart do good for us? You know, he, I think he's not talking about in a physical medicine, literally medicine, but he's talking about in a figurative way. When you laugh, it actually helps a lot of situations in life. Uh, as studies have actually shown that there's endorphins that will come in into the play when it comes to the idea of laughing that releases endorphins into the body and it helps us in a lot of ways it can relieve a lot of pressure in the situations that are pressured and when the appropriate things are said and times that are needed 
in the fitting words of laughter can brighten the day of a lot of people. It's like medicine that helps us to, to get through sometimes hard and difficult situations of life. But it has its time and place in our lives as well. As Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says, to everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And so all of that last part refers to the idea of there's times and seasons of life where we are uh, rejoicing. We are dancing in the sense of, of rejoicing and laughing. And I think that's good and proper. And there are types of, of laughter that is really inappropriate, especially when it's laughter about things that are wicked and sinful and vile, the telling of dirty jokes and things like that. That's never appropriate in that way. So we need to have appropriateness when we're trying to mock someone and laugh at them that way at someone else's expense. Again, that's not proper as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, going back just a, just a chapter in that same book, Solomon says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this all was also vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? We may think, well, what does it accomplish? It might make us feel good, and it's part of the experiences of life. What does it accomplish? Here he's testing several things to really find out what life is all about. Life's not all about laughter. There are times that it has a place. Now, when you go to a funeral in situations like that, that's no place to go in laughing and, and just taking things non-serious when it comes to that. There's times that we are in conversations that we have with people that we should not always be joking. Again, there's a time and place. I tell my kids all the time, there's a certain time and place for certain events. And I've had to learn myself that you can't always joke. It's not always proper to be joking when the situation calls for seriousness and the, the core is not something that you want to be a part about joking all the time. Then it's a time to be uh, in a sense of not joking. And, and there's a time to put that away. And so there's a time also to laugh and to tell jokes. And there's, there's a lot of clean jokes out there in the world today. You, a lot of the not-not jokes and, and things like that, uh, funny videos, funny comedies of today. There's a time and place for those types of things if it is wholesome and doesn't involve the vulgarity of, of this world today. But there is certain people in the Bible that the Bible records as laughing. And one of those is Sarah. As the Bible tells us that Sarah laughed in Genesis chapter 18, take your Bibles and turn over there to this first book of the New Testament, or the Old Testament, I should say. Uh, in Genesis chapter 18, uh, verses 9 through 15, we read the story when God came. It actually began with verse 1 of chapter 18. We find three men come uh, to Abraham, and they start first talking or to talking to Abraham. And then later on in verse 9, they began to ask about Sarah. And in verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, there in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the, at the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were, very, were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abram, Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. At this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however. Verse 15 tells us she kind of Evidently, it caught her off guard, and she didn't want to admit to laughing about this, but you know, it still was that she laughed. Verse 15 says, Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. You know, God knows what we do, what we don't do. And you know, she was, for fear, did not want to admit that she laughed, but it was the very case that she did laugh. And later on in chapter 11 of Hebrews, 
you'll find she's recorded in the great hall of faith right after Abraham, of one who believed and trusted in God that he would fulfill what he said. So you know, sometimes our first reaction may be to laugh at certain situations, but then also there's times when that situation can uh, be one that we think about it more seriously. We start to sit down and think, well, maybe I'll take this for more serious. That may very well happen with Sarah. We, we uh, don't know as far as the scriptures say, but it seems to be that that was her first reaction to finding out she's going to have a child and the Lord was going to give her that ability, even though she was past the age of childbearing. But then also there may be times when our enemies will laugh. They may laugh at us. And a lot of times that is the case. They are the ones who enjoy a good laugh at someone who is the, their enemy. They consider the someone who they're against. In Psalm 80, verse six, the Bible says, you have made us a strife to our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. And they're talking about holding them in derision and laughter. And, and here God, because of the punishments and things he did, uh, he, he, a lot of ways he caused the children of Israel to, to fall at their own hands because of their disobedience. And so to themselves, they brought, uh, God brought them down so their enemies would laugh at them at times. And that would be the case. Even sometimes today we see people when we have hard times in it, those who are, don't like us, who are enemies, who want to laugh at our situations of life and such. In Nehemiah chapter 2, going back to the Old Testament scriptures of Nehemiah chapter 2, here Nehemiah was wanting to go build the house of God. We begin with verse 17 of chapter 2. The Bible says, Then I said to them, You see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate, and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. He didn't want to have the people of God be a reproach because of their disobedience. They had lost the city of Jerusalem. And here they're wanting to go back. It's time to rebuild, Nehemiah says. I told them, verse 18, how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then he, they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat and Hornot, Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem and Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion right or memorial in Jerusalem. And so there's a lot about the enemies there, Sanballat and Tobiah, where they were against the people of God going back. They mocked them, and you can see them laughing at the idea of them going back and rebuilding the walls. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we see some of the things that actually said, the jokes, the kind of, they were given about this. So the Bible tells us in verse 3, now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. You can see that just a, just a fox going up there will tear down that wall. They're, they're not building anything strong. It just, it's so weak, it's flimsy. And so that's the, the derision. That's the mocking of enemies, the laughter of enemies sometimes when that happens. There's also times when foolish people may laugh at God's ways. And that's also sad because God wants us to be safe. He wants us to do what's right and live for him and serve him each and every day. In Psalm chapter 74, verse 18, the Bible says, remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oftentimes people speak against God and they will laugh and, and try to reproach the people of God. And that happens a lot. The Bible tells us Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so there's a lot of people today who have that same attitude today. They mock and they talk about the old man upstairs. That They simply can't be that person. And the God of the universe, there's a one person did all this. And there's a lot of people that will mock and will, and will do a lot of jokes. If you go to some of the websites, the people are against God, you'll see some of the most blasphemous, but also some of the most 
uh, what they might say, laughter and humor of that type of sort. But it's still against God, and it's still against his ways. And therefore, it should not be that that is the case. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9, you know, the Bible says that fools mock at sin. In other words, they have a good laugh at sin. They mock at the idea of sin being anything big or serious in their lives. But among the upright, there's favor because they take it seriously. They don't look at it like the fools who, who simply say, well, what sin? I, I remember hearing about a couple that came in to, uh, and how that somehow the husband will say, well, I must have took, I did something wrong. He's trying to blow that off. And really making light of the situation, he said some things that was kind of jokingly about his sins. But, you know, we should never joke and say, you know, those kind of things, whatever type of jokes there are about those, they should never be. That, that, that kind of laughter is not appropriate when we are trying to do what's right and live by God's word. But also we see times when we should take things seriously and we may take this completely like a joking sense. One of the sad parts about this, remember the story in Genesis 19 of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? One of the things the Bible tells a lot, and his, and his sons-in-laws, they came and they thought he was just joking. The Bible says, so, so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, verse 14 tells us, who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But who his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. And so they didn't take that seriously. And evidently, they were, they were lost with all the rest of the people there because only Lot and his two daughters actually escaped from the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So that was a sad occasion when someone, the two sons-in-law, they should have took this seriously. And, and you know what Lot said was only said to try to help them to get out of the city. He was concerned about their lives. So they laughed at something they should not, the punishment of God came on those two cities regardless. And so they were lost right along with those. In 2 Kings chapter 2, here is a situation where there's a prophet of God. Elisha is the prophet of God. And it says, he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up to the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, bald head. Go up, bald head. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And that's a sad occasion where it didn't really have to take place. But it did take place because people, these young youth, the young individuals here, who were mocking the prophet of God. And they were basically, when you mock the prophet of God, you're actually mocking God and his ways. Because God was with Elisha. He was with him every step of the way. And yet these people, they lost lives, evidently. They were mauled because of their sin of, of mocking and laughter. You know, it even tells us what they were saying. You know, they were talking about his bald head. Like I said, it's never appropriate to make fun and belittle other people in laughter. So we ought to think of that way. You know, we ought to respect the golden rule and say what you don't want people to do to you, you don't do them in some way. You know, the Bible tells us, and that's kind of a paraphrase of that, you know, as we want men to do to us, we should do also to them. As they, we often would say, do unto others as you'd have them do to you. And so if we don't like to be mocked, then we don't like people uh, making us the, the punchline of a joke, then we should not do that to other people as well when it comes to how we interact with other people. In Second Chronicles chapter 30, again, another sad instance when the people of God, Hezekiah, is trying to get back to the right order of God and, and doing all the sacrifices, getting back to a, a spiritual worship back in Israel. And here he's trying to get all the, the cities. And he sent people to every one of the cities. And he sent some, the Bible says, so the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun. But they laughed at them and mocked them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And also, also the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. And so there were some, but what about those who laughed and, and mocked? You know, that kind of laughing and mocking, we see that several times in the scriptures 
uh, like on the day of Pentecost, some will say, well, these people are, are full of new wine. And at Acts chapter 17, where Paul is at Mars Hill, some mocked when they heard about the resurrection. You can see them maybe laughing about the idea, can there really be a resurrection and of the dead and, and someone come back once they have died? And so that keeps people from, from obeying the faith by their laughter at things they should not be laughing God's ways. But God warns the wicked not to laugh when it comes to their sins. And that's pretty much what uh, James is talking about here in James chapter 4. But again, verse 8, here is what, they, what God wants them to do, to draw near to him. In verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now here's where we're talking about the idea of, of not laughing about our sins. This is, he says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now God's not saying, you know, if there's any kind of joy or any kind of laughter just in life in general, then you can, should have that. He's not saying it's wrong to laugh at all. That's basically what I'm trying to say there. He's doing it for a specific purpose. This purpose is, that not to have the laughter when it comes to everything's okay in my life and I'm joyful about my situation that I'm in sin, that I need to get out of that sin. That's basically the context of James chapter 4 in this particular verse. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. There's the antidote is to humble ourselves and to not be those ones who are like, I think pretty much a good example of this would be the city of Nineveh and how that they, they wore the sackcloth and ashes, and, and they, they actually repented of their sins. They weren't puffed up like the, the Corinthian church about the man who took his father's wife, but they were ones who said, we're going to get back to service of God in mourning and weeping for our sins. There's not enough of that today, is there, where people are willing to do what's right and live for the Lord in a way and have not have a joyful feeling about their sins. Jesus said himself in Luke chapter 6, verse 25, Woe to you who are, are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You know those people, though, who are laughing and mocking at Jesus and how they would say things against him? They should have been mourning then. And they may laugh then, but, you know, understand, they were on line for punishment. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. All that would take place because of the rejection of, of Jesus as their Messiah. And so God warns the wicked not to laugh at the times we not, should not have laughter. But also God comforts the afflicted with laughter. And this is our last point. In Luke chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. That's the companion verse to verse 25. He said, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. He's talking about people, again, the context is the same context of Matthew 5, verse 4. This is, again, parallel, but it's not the same rendering. It, it's, evidently, Jesus spoke this on several occasions in the Sermon on the Mount, and there may be the Sermon on the Plain when it comes to these types of things that Jesus said. Matthew 5, verse 4, Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so there's times when our sorrow now will bring us laughter and comfort later. And that's really the God of all comfort who will do that. He will bring to us the things that we need at the appropriate time. And it, right now, we may have many, many tears, many sorrows, but yet one day, things will be different. God will help us to see the, all that through. I hope this lesson has been beneficial in some way, that we can do what God wants and live and serve him every day. And if you have any questions about lessons like this and, or the plan of salvation, about hearing, believing, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God and baptism for the very remission of your sins. Those are, the way, those are the ways that God has said, you do these things, you're obeying the gospel of my Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for your kind attention to the lesson today. You have a good day today and enjoy life with the laughter that God made for us today.